Oh my, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, guys. So, it's come to my attention that you guys are doing something very, 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 very terribly wrong. Almost none of you are actually designing your solutions before coding. And even if you do, you have asked the design. Then, for some for God forsaken reason, you run straight into coding with a half-baked idea of what you want to do. Praying that once you start debugging the bad code, you'll come up with a magical solution. What the hell? Uh. Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about solving problems that you have no idea how to solve. We're going to tackle one of the most difficult problems in problem solving. How to unstick yourself when you get stuck on a problem. Yes, I talked about heuristics and rules of thumb in my last video, and those guide your thinking. But those only serve as temporary frameworks that guide you to an answer that you have some idea about. The question we want to answer is how do we accomplish that without a proper template or guide? Or more specifically, how do we solve a problem that we are stuck on or have no idea about? This will lead to a bigger discussion about software engineering, design, and why the engineering process is the way it is. But that's for another video. For today, we're sticking with the coding interview. So before I begin, if you could like this video and subscribe and watch it all the way to the end, that would really help me out. It takes a long time to make these videos on top of planning the script, but also driving this entire system for you guys. Liking and watching till the end lets me know that you appreciate what I do here and lets me know you want to see more content like this. So with that, welcome to the coding interview. You suck. So before I arrive at my talking point, let's actually talk about the very base case, the interview. We've all been there. You have a question in front of you and you don't really know how to solve it. You're stuck. Whether that's because you can't figure out the bug in your code or you can't figure out what your code is supposed to do. It doesn't matter. What do you do in this situation? To answer this, let's go back to the original issue. What exactly are you trying to do? And when I say this, I'm not asking necessarily in a philosophical sense. I mean it more in an objective sense. The ultimate goal here is to pass the interview. Solving the problem will allow the interviewer to give us that green check mark and get us one step closer to the offer. That seems pretty obvious, right? Well, okay. Just bear with me for a little bit and let's have a conversation. So, have you tried solving the problem? Yes, but unfortunately, I don't know how to solve this problem. But I really, really need to write the code. Well, what do you need to know before you write the code? I need to figure out what my code is supposed to do. Well then, what do you need to do in order to know what your code is supposed to do? I need to have a series of steps to solve the problem. Well then, what do you need to do in order to have a series of steps that will help you solve the problem? I need to test against a bunch of examples in order to find the common pattern or the core algorithm that I can code up. Then, what do you need to do in order to test a bunch of examples and find a common pattern? Well, I guess I can start with the most common and general case and then build on top of that to handle my edge cases. So then, how do you start with the common and general case? Well, I need to parse the problem and strip it down to its core components. And this is where we get to the ambiguity. Everyone has their own way of dissecting the problem. Some people value generating a bunch of examples. Other people try to tweak independent inputs and outputs. But in all these cases, none of them, none of them start with coding. In fact, coding is the last thing you want to be doing. Out of the six questions that we had in this conversation, only three of them are explicitly trying to decreate the design, while one of them is actually writing the design down. Only one of these questions is related to actually writing the goddamn code. So how is it that you guys put so much emphasis on writing the code if most of the questions are about design? Because the truth is, the design is preventing you from actually writing the code itself, and most of the considerations and tasks at hand are not coding. But okay, let's just say for some reason you really think that coding takes a large chunk of interview time. So, you want to dedicate as much time as you can to coding, right? But do you know what else can shorten that time? Knowing what you're doing. And if you watch any of my coding sessions, you'll find that once the candidate has a very clear idea of what design they want to do, they only really spend seven minutes writing the code itself. So, out of the potential 35 minutes that you have for the interview, about 20% is going to actually be writing code. So wouldn't it be better for you to optimize on the other 80% to get a better time? So let's actually take these questions and codify it into an actual priority list 
something that we can use when dealing with a problem. Consider this a priority list from zero to N, where zero is the first priority. If you encounter an issue of higher priority or lower number, you must deal with it before proceeding to the next issue. So what are these priorities? Let's dive into it. Priority zero is when you don't understand the problem or there's vagueness in the problem or you misunderstand the premises. This means that if there is some ambiguity in the problem, whether it's a question of input type, time space limit, or just plain English, then this requires your immediate attention. Maybe you should take a step back and try to understand what exactly is being asked of you. Priority one is that you don't have enough examples or that your test cases are wrong. If your examples are wrong, your algorithm will be tested against bad inputs. This means that your algorithm could be solving the wrong problem or you might have the right algorithm and your test cases or examples are messing you up and telling you it's wrong. Either way, this is preventing you from proving your results. Priority two is that your design is flawed or missing. Then you need to change your design. The design is the pseudocode of how you plan to handle all the examples and solve the problem. It's the diagram of what your code should look like. It's easier to draw an arrow or change a few English words than it is to chop up code, glue it back together, and then test and make sure that it still works. Then we have priority number three, that your code does not reflect the design. Either change your design or change your code. Your design should be very solid, so I would almost always lean towards changing the code. Retesting the design in case you find a new edge case or step might not necessarily be that bad, but you really should not be doing this. Then you have priority number four, that your code is bugged. At this point, you have already made sure your design and examples are bulletproof. This means that if your code is wrong, it's an implementation issue and you're free to muck around in that code, especially because it is structured and therefore it's probably easier to find the bug. There are certain cases where you can kind of skip over some of the steps, especially when you get really, really confident at this and if they're really trivial. But when practicing, consider priorities zero to two as being absolute blockers. For the coding interview, you can take your foot off the gas a little bit and only consider priorities zero and one as blockers. Each subsequent step is harder to implement in terms of cost and thinking. But do you know what the beauty is of doing these things in this order? If you have a template to copy and refer back to at each subsequent step, especially if that previous step is bulletproof, then that makes your life so much easier. Most people end up doing some weird priority list of 1042 or some variation of that. But what ends up happening because of that is that they get stuck on very, very time consuming steps where they could potentially be fixing only one issue only to have 10 issues come up together. But they never had that design before. So the only way they can change their design is to keep changing their code, which takes exponentially longer and longer and longer to fix until they have this very, very big ball of spaghetti code that they can't even untangle. This leads to a rejection and an interview fail. The only part where I think it's okay to get stuck on is being unable to come up with an algorithm once given a bunch of examples. This is because the pattern might not be immediately obvious or is super subtle or nuanced. You're only allowed one hint at this stage anymore and you're asking the interviewer to carry you. Everyone has their own way of parsing the problem and at that point, it's really just up to experience and intelligence to carry you through. Sometimes you've seen the problem before or at least something similar. Other times, it's just using the tools and techniques that you've used before in analyzing and solving the problem. In other words, actually solving the problem is based on how much quality practice you have when doing leak code versus throwing random shit at the compiler. Funny how that works, right? So where do my order of operations come in? If you recall, my order of operations are three steps. I first try to match it to something that I've studied. If I can't match it, I'll try to generate examples to find a pattern. Then I'll actually try to optimize the sub steps, but these operations have nothing to do with code. It's just an approach that I tried to use in order to figure out the core algorithm and my design, whether that is trying to see if they follow a template or if they have a common pattern that I can leverage. Nowhere in these steps do I do anything that requires code. After all, I can always optimize over it. These steps might look different from person to person, but they are roughly the same. But even then, it is so much easier to fix a design than it is to fix your code. So next time you find yourself stuck, Ask yourself, have you tried solving the problem? I hope this priority list helps. In the next video, we are going to conclude this series by showing you how everything that you have learned regarding the coding interview and the actual engineering process are actually very similar and how you can take what you've learned in this video series to your actual job. So stick around. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you all in the next one. <music>